Hi. How is everybody? Hyperlink document retrieval system. And it wasn't even a very good hyperlink document retrieval system. It didn't include transclusion, didn't include attribution, or any kind of compensation system. Um, but it very Just making sure some things are set up on the stream. The basis of everything that's going on. That initial design for a hypertext okay. system did not anticipate presentation, session interactivity, or monetization, or advertising, or, or any so, of the other stuff. So, uh, tonight this is more of the same. Possible. Just gonna... In fact, if the web slowly learn system, more things about Project Zomboy, and I've got Mr. Crocker up here. Over here. Hi, Mr. Crocker. Mr. Crockford is telling us about um, the DOM, the document object model, which is what um, the web browser uses. So I'm going to start it over from the beginning. It's an old video. Okay, so time for Project Zomboid. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to start after. I, I like a fresh start. When I started doing the classes in JavaScript, a lot Survivor. of people came to me afterwards and said, we really like the information about JavaScript, but we didn't say anything about King's browser, browser, seems browser like the easiest one. I thought about that for a long time because you know, what is the browser? The browser is a, is a vast source of incompatibility, pain, and misery. I didn't really want to stand up for a couple of Yeah, I'm going to go with Kingsmith. Go through all the quirks and bugs and all the okay. conditions of browsers. For one thing, it would go out of date too fast. Um, it would just be too painful to sit through. Burglar. Too painful to talk to about for a couple of hours. So, and so it, I searched for some other way of talking about the DOM. Document object model on the browser, something which would be more useful. And so I, I came up with the idea for a theory class. And in this class, we're going to talk about the history of the browser, I'm why it is the way it is. Talk about familiarize myself with all of these the so I can make time. faster decisions. Okay, this will give you the information you need to interpret what you see in the documentation, interpret what you see in the Doing a lot of running. The original vision it's not going to do anything like I think a big one. Illiterate. We'll go with that one. Just continuing my stand against books that I had from before. Okay. So now that gives me two extra points to spend. I'm going to spend it on cat's eyes. And this is a really simple build. I'm going to save it as a very other stuff. It's simple. In fact, if the web were still consistent with Timber and Reeves' original vision, Yahoo would still be two guys. It's probably a bad name for it, but whatever. But clearly, there's more going on here than that. So something else happened. Twyla Hacker. How we got here is a consequence of Twyla Hacker. Frantic rule breaking that. A lot of the story of the web is about standards, but it's also about breaking the rules. Um, this all happened in the context of intense corporate warfare, all under extreme conflict. Not the best recipe for breaking up just about anything. So the amazing thing is that it works. There are a lot of other systems that we have to find about the same time. Video dial tone, for example, Java. Did the game crash on me? There is something really amazing about the web that despite all of no, its it's just problems, okay. it's actually been a very, very crisis avoided. Communications medium. I've heard this game does the key have idea bugs, that, that made it but like, was the you know, web browser, which my opinion on uh, bugs and games is, you know, it just happened. Like all, first of all, they all have bugs. Every last game you've ever played has a bug in it somewhere. Navigator 2. 
It was the first browser that had a scripting language. As long as they don't get in the way of uh, nobody paid any playing, attention you know, to that capability. At least at the time not all the time. All the I don't know. Java I think it gives them a certain charm sometimes. Um, like when JavaScript software is a little buggy. Really, uh, you know, not important it at means that time. like they they're giving it room until after to Java grow. Failed. Their uh, systems um, are, the front line you know, of the browser war. not interacting uh, correctly Netscape with each other because maybe there's uh, directly attacked each other, uh, a bit too much uh, loose coupling, the, the medium of you know, browser API. but like they've got a bigger Microsoft vision ahead, made some and, you know, advancements to the a game, the a game that is as um, in-depth as this uh, in terms of all the mechanics, the um, I would expect their it's been Both more companies than a were few bucks. attempting to set proprietary traps but, in the I mean, browser in order to uh, create that's even around their server. Depending that Netscape around their whatever they're referring to is like a and mechanic, Microsoft with around their um, IIS a game mechanic, and not like a something Both in the user interface. I don't know. Failed, I think, okay, that's incredibly of, boring. Um, aside, I, I apologize for that. But, but I, I really should have just left it at all. I think it's charming when browser. games have so bugs. I think I got my point across when I said that. So I, everybody pretty much I didn't really need to justify it. Traps. It's also interesting that at, at that time, Process, Netscape cheese, owned the word strawberries. Live. Okay. Live script, live wire, uh, live so I typically die pretty quickly. But Netscape is gone now. So I don't Microsoft know. Now owns live. And they're, they're doing live. I should and spend so much time being careful being until I learn to stop doing that. Um, after Netscape failed, we saw a huge reduction in okay, the rate of innovation in uh, browser technology. Uh, so this I, turns out to be a really, really good thing. Because uh, we'll, we'll later see the effect of the changes in the web. And I just need to get them away from the spawn point. Was the first step in it, and it's, um, standards actually work. I'm just so bad at the combat. I should have looked for a weapon in that. Brady Lawrence. Okay. Their browser okay, so now I'm just gonna like throw up a and so you have to wait for book. really Can't long read. cycles I'm for this stuff to get pushed out. But it finally book. has, and so in the last ten years, um, the browser finally became stable as a result of, of this piece, um, and that allowed uh, Jesse James Garrett to rediscover um, the interactivity made possible by the scripted browser, giving it the new name Ajax. But Ajax is not based on anything that we didn't have over five years ago. The only thing which is new about Ajax is that nothing happened for five years, and that allowed the browser to become stable enough that you could consider it again as an application platform. This is a, a rough flowchart of the way a browser works. In particular, this is uh, uh, the Netscape uh, or uh, Mosaic-style browser. I start at one end, giving it a URL, which then goes into a fetch engine, which will go out on the web and find it and, and read it in and put it in a cache. Then there's a parse engine, which will take a document out of the cache, parse it, uh, discover all of the HTML content in it, and produce a tree. I want to make this my base. I want this to be my base. That you know, like that then gets to where my character a hangs out. Engine, which will do layout. Uh, calculating the size and position of each of the elements. I mean, strategically, um, that's not a good a idea. Which display list, which could be an annotation of the tree, or it could be a separate structure. Because you spawn given here. Given paint engine, which will then go through and convert all that stuff into pixels. And if the base gets the overrun, then you just spawn in the same. This is the, the classical model of a web browser. I guess that would apply everywhere, though. Way. 
whatever. One of the innovations in Netscape 1 was to get around a, a problem that was in Mosaic, where when the parse engine hit an image tag, it wouldn't know how big the image was going to be. So it would stop at that point, go back to the fetch engine, fetch it, read it in, figure out how big it was, and then resume. So for people using Mosaic, they wouldn't see anything until all of the assets on the page had been read in. Um, if you were walk, uh, pulling in documents off of a, a university network, which is what it was designed for, that wasn't too bad, but if you were using dial-up modems, as most people were at that time, it was a horrible experience. So the thing that Netscape did was, when they got to this point, they still went back to the fetch engine and, and got the image, but they also put a placeholder in the document and said, we're going to have a picture here, but we don't know how big yet. Okay, kept on check going. this out. Um, I have a griddle pan. Later, that looks heavy. When the, I could probably do uh, some serious arrived, damage with this. They would go back to the flow and flow and paint a second time. And they would flow and paint again for every image that finally got read in. This had the result of taking significantly more time to do the, the final rendering. But the user perception was that you saw stuff immediately. And it was perceived as a huge uh, advantage over the mosaic because you could get the idea that you could go through the flow and the cycle multiple times was okay. one of the key ideas in the descriptive browser. So Netscape 2, they, they took that idea and pushed it further. So you could flow and then paint, and then they'd wait for an event. The event could be something coming from the fetch engine again, saying, we've got that image you asked for. Or it could be, um, it could be a UI event, like something like that. Like nice. Which would cause a script to get executed, a function would get invoked, which has access to the tree, and it would manipulate the tree. When it was all done, it would go back and flow and paint and do it again. This is basically the loop that all web browsers used to have. And the browser is single-threaded, so it goes step by step. This is a very effective weapon. Browsers at Yahoo. As long as you're only doing one at a time. Um, this is the, the A list, the A grade browsers in our uh, graded browser support program. This I think is going to be one of the most effective tools in, in managing the browser makers as we we're only going to have browsers on this list. That guy was tough. Why was he so tough? Sufficient quality um, that it is worth it to us to, to develop for it. One of the other nice things about this list is it's going to get shorter over time. Uh, these he was so tough. Browsers in pink are scheduled to get dropped off the list next quarter. What that means is you have fewer browsers that you have to worry about, fewer browsers that you have to test, um, and we can focus on the, the fast part of the market. We'll still send pages to those other guys, but we're not going to send them JavaScript okay. and we're not going to send them CSS. So the, the most uh, advanced applications were, are only going to go to these browsers. Um, one of uh, Netscape's innovations in Navigator 2 was the script tag, providing a way of putting a program into an HTML document. Oh, Netscape um, is responsible the for the script tag. They, uh, Interesting. Caused a problem. The script, the rule in HTML is that if you see a tag and you don't recognize it, you just ignore the tag but display whatever its contents are, as though the tag had not been there. That would cause the script to appear on older browsers, which was annoying. Um, so to get around that, they put an idea of putting HTML at the beginning of the script. JavaScript comment with a close HTML comment on the other end. And that would cause the older browsers to not see the text and so they, they won't show it anymore. Um, and then they put a, a trick into Netscape 2 so that it wouldn't treat the comment as a comment, it would actually pass it through the JavaScript. Um, that was a close one. I didn't swing at just the right moment. Necessary for it would have been a goner. So if you're not expecting browsers such as Mosaic or Netscape 1 to be reading your page, you really don't need to be doing that anymore. This is a common pattern that you still see a lot on the web, basically because most 
web developers learned it by copying other people's stuff and they see this in there and most people don't know what that is or, or why it's there. It's there to get around a bug in Netscape 1, you probably don't need it anymore. Uh, next uh, trick is something that um, uh, Microsoft came up with. They didn't like the idea of JavaScript. They would rather have a Microsoft language, in particular Visual Basic. So they came up with a dialect, kind of nice hot cup of uh, tea here, and I'm just script, which I'm sitting on it. Microsoft, Microsoft Take a moment to listen to what JavaScript. Mr. Crockford has to say. Um, in order to, to make that possible, they uh, allowed you to select what language you wanted to use in your script. Netscape actually liked that feature because they thought it would allow them to uh, be a little looser in modifying JavaScript since you could identify which version or edition of JavaScript you're going to be working with. That turned out in retrospect to be a really bad idea. Um, the, they diverged too much from standards, from their own standards, um, and it, it became just too difficult to manage. W3C eventually. I used to listen to these attribute. lectures like every day. So Not that there's like really even anything particularly useful, like knowing all the like little bits uh, something of like history a, that went into making in, the browser uh, what it is. Navigator three That's interesting. Was source tag, um, which allows you to load but it doesn't your script from really source or, or from outside of like um, this turns out to be a giving really, you a better really conception idea. of how because the DOM works. In retrospect, it's to be a really bad not the idea most important thing to learn in, the middle of your HTML. in web development. Um, being able to keep them but it's interesting means that just like seeing much easier to inspect the, how this technology um, Came to be program. It's why easier certain to use, decisions uh, were made. Software tools on it like uh, compression tools so, and validation tools. I just like Crockford's so lectures. Very highly recommend not putting lectures, any, sorry. any JavaScript in your HTML Blech. instead using source tag. Can't speak. Then finally, um, W3C added a uh, text type attribute, um, which uh, was intended to replace uh, the deprecated language okay. attribute. Except now, instead of the name of a language, you have a MIME type. There are a couple of problems with this. The first one is the official MIME type for JavaScript wasn't issued until this year. I think somebody's in the house. It's application I think slash so. JavaScript or application slash JavaScript. There's no browser currently out there which knows that. Um, so in order to use this tag, or this attribute, you have to use a non-standard MIME type, which is just wrong. The other thing is that if you're using the source which you should be. Um, the browser ignores this anyway. It trusts the server who's providing the file to tell it. Yep, wash yourself in the toilet. Let's go. So this is irrelevant. It's ignored. So again, I don't see any point. Where you put your script tag in your program can have a large impact on it. impact on the user experience. I recommend that you place trip tags as low, as close to the bottom of the body. Some of this possible. advice is a little obsolete too. So like, you place your CSS links you're rarely just going to be doing vanilla JavaScript. You know, you're rarely going to be worried anymore about your index HTML page. You're going to let your framework handle all that, you know, bootstrapping of your environment. Also, currently, we're recommending that you reduce the number of script files Close as much curtains. as you can by concatenating all of your scripts together into one file. Eventually, we're going to back away from that recommendation as things like YUI uh, get wider deployed and are more likely to be in cache. Um, and as the browsers get better at caching, we're finding that. Uh, our Don't know what this does. Is much higher than we would expect right now. Uh, so until all that stuff gets worked out, it's a good idea to minimize the number of files. Uh, the next innovation Sorry. that Netscape came Whoops. up with was document write. In retrospect, this was a really, really bad idea, um, and they should have been aware of this at the time. Basically, as the document is being parsed, they have a script in that same document, which is rewriting the document as it goes on. It took them a long time to get that right. There's some really intricate uh, timing and context that, that is easily messed up. Um, and it introduces a 
lot of things which are now considered bad practice. And also now there are much better alternatives for all the things that we want to use, not just bad practice. It also has a problem that is very sensitive to when you call it. If you call it before onload fires, you will insert stuff into your document. But if you do it afterwards, it destroys your document and replaces it with new stuff. And that can be a really confusing error to have. There's a lot of stuff in this house. You need so, to get it all back to uh, base. Bottom line, don't recommend use of Dr. Uh, the, the next thing that Netscape did was provide a set of collections. The earliest view of the DOM was as a collection of collections, and through these collections, you could get at particular elements and modify them. Uh, these collections are still available in the browsers. They're not in any standard, but they're obsolete now. They're see more modern alternatives to all these things. So these are pretty much irrelevant now. There are two attributes that exist on most things, name and ID. For a long time it was really confusing as to what they were as well. Because the browsers treated them as though they were interchangeable. In fact, in terms of the implementation, they were exactly interchangeable. And each would default for the other. So with that kind of feedback coming from the browsers, um, there's no indication to most developers as to what their role was or how to use it. That's largely been cleaned up, and so now it's clear what the roles are and it's good that you that we work with it correctly. So name is used to identify values in form data. It's the name that gets sent back to the server when you submit. The name's also used to correlate radio buttons like gadgets which get find the end. It can also be used to identify the name of a window in the frame. Uh -oh. ID is a thing that you should use to uniquely identify an element. So we um, used to be the same That fucking sucks. Microsoft introduced something called Dr. Law. It responds to Netscape's Every tag in the document that had a name or ID was accessible through this collection. Um, the W3C decided not to, to go with that approach. Uh, so because they didn't, I recommend that you don't either. Um, this is a, a, a Microsoft thing and it's not portable to Firefox. Having an ID on an element is now possible to get at that element. Uh, but instead of using document all, W3C said that instead we should use document.getElement by ID this to sucks. the ID as a string. Now I can't. Uh, this has the advantage that's longer in the Now I gotta go occupy the other house. Um, also, you need to be careful in the spelling out. of the name. It's a capital I small d. It, it's a, a very easy to think you need a capital D at the end. Very common mistake. Um, to provide um, an alternative to the uh, classes of collections that Netscape provided, they have a you know, document that get elements by name. Notice that elements here is plural. That's because names are not required to be unique, like IDs are. Um, and this will return an array of things which happen to have a name. Uh, then they added a, another thing which is useful. Um, get elements by tag name. Uh, we can call this one not just on the whole document, but on any node. Um, so if we want to get all of the images within some subtree, um, we can use that call. Um, this is an example of a tree. Uh, this tree is produced from this HTML. And there are some interesting things to notice about it. Uh, the first thing is that these tag names were all in lowercase, but these are in uppercase. Um, early on, there was a whole lot of confusion about case in the browser, and a lot of that's been worked out, but this is a case where it hasn't. Um, so we need to be aware that when we get a node name or tag name back on an element, it may be uppercase. Um, there are also a couple other things that are in here that are in the text. For example, there's a head node here. We didn't include one here. The browser went ahead and added them for us. Also, it put up a, a document node at the top, which is the big root for this tree. 
Also, uh, this particular tree is the Internet Explorer tree. Firefox will give you a different tree. Um, and you might think that's uh, inconvenient, and, and you'd be right. The reason for that is, is that um, W3C requires that the white space between there and there be captured in a text node and stuck in the tree. So there'd be, the tree would be a lot hairier because all that extra unnecessary white space would be trapped in the structure. Uh, what that means to you as a programmer is that you might want to get the first element that's after the body map. You might expect that would be the head tag, but it won't necessarily. It will on IE, it won't on Mozilla. Um, this is a case where Microsoft is not implementing the standard, but is doing the thing which is actually better for programmers. Um, they departed from the W3C recommendation when they thought it was wrong. Um, I don't know why Microsoft thinks they can get away with that, but uh, historically they have. The problem is, they're the only ones that get away with that, and everybody else did it the W3C way, which means you need to be prepared to do it both ways. Uh, finally, JavaScript provides access to some of these nodes directly. Um, the document um, uh, object in JavaScript, or in, in, in the browser, links you directly to that node. It is that node. Uh, similarly, document.body gets you directly to the body node, and document.document element gets you to the HTML node. And you might wonder, why isn't that one called document.html? Okay. Um, so here's a, uh, a, a zoom in on, on the body part of that tree. Um, the way that the linkage occurs is a little bit more complicated than what we saw in the first diagram. Each of these has not one child pointer, but two. One for the first child and one for the last child. Uh, so here we see it has pointers to the H1 and the last P. These are the forgotten neglected real children. Now each of these had one text node, and both of their pointers point to the text node. In addition to those pointers, we also have sibling pointers. So each of these has a forward sibling called next sibling and a previous sibling. These nodes here are cousins. Unfortunately, we don't have pointers to deal with cousins. These guys are coming together. This body tag would have a previous sibling to link to this head tag. Finally, there are the links for the Unfortunately, you don't have to maintain these pointers to be maintained by the system. In my view, they're all read on the mechanic background. Also, it turns out that you really don't want to be doing programs here. You know, I have a map. It's really good to use your cost to produce a structure. Um, mostly, you just want to go through everything. So for any subtree, I want to visit each of the nodes in the same order that they were in the text. Um, and to do that, these are the only pointers you really need to do. I mean, this is a classic binary tree. This is sufficient for representing any tree. I think I'm safe. So um, I think I'm screwed. There's a recursive function which allows us to do this. This is a process called walking the DOM, where we're going to go through the tree and, and visit all the nodes and do something useful with each node that we visit. So. We've got a walking the DOM program or function. We'll pass it a node. This will be the node that we're going to start traversing at. And we'll pass it a function. This is a function that we want to call. I don't have any first aid. No it. first aid. What am I supposed to do? So the first thing we do is call a function. My character the has like a broken hand. hand or something. We'll see if the node has a first child. If it does, we call walk the DOM on that node. And when it comes back, we then look to see if we have a next sibling. And if we do, then we do that. And we keep doing this until it's done. This is a recursive function because it walk the DOM calls, walk the DOM. Uh, so it'll keep going through recursively until it gets Okay, so I went and to this sleep. Will visit the whole tree in order. Why is this useful? 
Uh, here's an example. One of the access methods that W3C uh, forgot, didn't consider, was by class name. This turns out to be really useful because you can identify um, that a bunch of files in your document are in your class and you want to automatically do something in that class. Um, so, this is a function with three statements. First, we create an, uh, an empty array of results. We call lock the DOM, and then we return the results. And all the work is done in the function that we pass to lock the DOM. Um, so we'll, we'll pass it a document body, or we could pass it any node, but that's where we want to start. Um, and we pass it this function. And what the function will do is, for each node that it visits, uh, get the class name. Now, first a note about class name. What is class name? There's nothing in HTML called class name. Um, but there is something in HTML called class, and that's what we're talking about here. So why is it dot class name and not, not dot class? It's because of an error in JavaScript, class is a reserved word, uh, and we can't use it as a member. So the solution that Netscape came up with was they would just append name on it, and then it isn't a reserved word anymore. Um, Okay, so we get the class name. And it turns out class name is still a wrong name because class name can be plural. Uh, you can have multiple class names separated by space. So uh, we need to, to deal with that. So if we find a class name, we'll split it on spaces. This creates an array of strings, which are class names. And then we'll search for each of the class names that we found and see if it matches the thing that we're searching for. And if it does, then we accumulate it and add it to our, our results. So this will go through and very quickly find all of the elements of a certain class. Uh, one bit of extra fun, each node also has an array called child nodes, uh, which will be a linear list of everything that's contained within it. So just in case you were worried about those neglected middle children, they are, Karen actually does know who they are because it has this array also. Okay, so once you get a hold of an element by using uh, get element by ID or, or some other mechanism, then you want to manipulate it. Um, and each kind of element has a different set of things that you can do with it. These are some of the properties of an image tag. These are the properties that all of the major browsers support. Um, all of the browsers also have things that are not on this list, which are uh, features that are unique to themselves. You probably want to avoid those uh, and just stick to the stuff which is most common. Um, and then you can change any of these properties simply by doing an assignment, since what you're getting back is a JavaScript object, and uh, JavaScript allows you to modify objects uh, this simply. So I, I have the, the element of the node and its property name, I have an assignment of change the source, for example, of an image simply by doing this on um, So that's the old school. The new school is, uh, this is the W3C recommendation, instead that you call get attribute. My right hand is now infected. Call, uh, I didn't have a way of healing it. Pass it a string and a value. Um, which is better? Um, this is obviously smaller and faster. Um, this has one property I like. Um, set here has side features, you know, change of source, stuff that, that causes an action. Take I it like back. Things that have side effects to the implications rather than side ones. Is that an important enough distinction? I don't know. Um, this mode is bigger and harder to type. Um, both are as top. This works only on older browsers, but both work on A grade browsers. Generally, I prefer using this. Um, another thing that you can change is style, and there are a couple of ways you can go about that. Uh, the first one is you can change the class name um, simply by assigning a new string or a new bunch of strings uh, with spaces concatenated in between them. Um, this goes back to the CSS process and figures Eight out breakfast. all the properties again. Washed. Washed my clothes. If you want to do something a little no. bit more Items. Apparently, go the all the power is going to go off. 
Like in this game, like you only get a few days before the power goes off because you know there's nobody around powering anything anymore. I should be collecting things like generators, batteries, I guess, gas. I don't know. I don't know how to assemble those things. If I did find them, or where to look for them. If you want to see what, what CSS's opinion of the object is, on IE you can go to uh, Node's current style and retrieve it. So when they do the CSS processing, for every object in the tree, they figure out every possible permutation of styling parameter, and they assign it for each object. So that's really convenient. But W3C didn't want to do it that way. So the W3C model is, instead you say document default view, you get the view and then you call get computed style for the node, and then once you have that, you can get a property value from the style node you get that. Um, the guys who designed this were not web developers. They didn't know JavaScript. Zombie, so. And I've got a, a griddle pan. I'm sure it doesn't actually use the pan, but. Okay, so. I'm gonna rename this. I'm gonna delete all of these. Where's illiterate? You could also um, create a text mode. Also include all of the descendants of that node as well. So one way that you can build up a recurring structure is make one and then clone a whole bunch more. Now none of these will create something that's connected to the DOM. You get a new thing, but it doesn't have a parent pointer yet, and it isn't connected, it won't be shown, it isn't active. So it won't be active and visible until you actually plug it into the document object model. And we've got methods for doing that. Uh, first one is append char. So we give it the, uh, we call this on the intended parent node, and we pass it the new node that we want to attach to. And this goes at the end of the list of children. I don't know what to call this build. And that's usually exactly what Burglar you want, zero. Is a reasonable way to do it. But sometimes you want to insert it at a different place in the order of children. So to do Jamie that, Erickson. Uh, you also, you 
recall insert before and you pass along okay, with let's go. the sibling that you want to place before. Um, but th this is a really odd thing because the sibling knows what the parent is. I could just say insert this before this guy, but the interface doesn't work that way. I have to call it on the parent instead. It becomes really obvious when you look at replace child. I've got um, some bit of stuff and I want it to go away and be replaced by something else. Um, I, I could, uh, you could imagine doing that with two parameters, but we have to have three of them here. Essentially what you're saying is old.parent node replace new old. So you have to specify old twice uh, for no good reason. Um, and again, this is a W3C kind of Java-oriented, model-based, uh, nothing in common with reality sort of API. We'll see more examples of this. character is very weak. It's important that you remove any event handlers from the object before you delete it. Um, Come on, Jamie. Um, something that W3C didn't anticipate was that we would want access to the HTML parser. Uh, we might get HTML from the server and we want to plug it directly into our document or we might want to do client-side HTML generation and it makes some HTML because it's not a bad representation of, of document material and then plug that into the document. W3C uh, provided no way of doing that. Uh, their model was that you would have to parse it yourself. You'd have to write a parser in JavaScript, which would go through and break down the HTML and then call uh, the methods that made uh, new elements and link them all together and then plug that into it, which is a huge amount of work and it would be really slow. And browsers already have really good HTML parsers built into them. There are a lot of things wrong with browsers, but they are really, really good at doing that. So it makes sense that we have access to that capability. Uh, so Microsoft anticipated that. And so in their interface, they created something called Inner HTML, which I think was the wrong name. I would rather they had something like Set HTML and made it a method. But it's have a little bit of a brewski. Assign HTML text to it, and it gets handed to the parser and it builds a tree and plugs it into the box. Really, really convenient. Okay. Uh, when Mozilla was designing their next generation, they recognized this omission of the W3C standard, so they copied what Microsoft did. And Safari also copied it, and uh, Opera also copied it. So all of the A grade browsers support their HTML. There's no standard that describes it, no standard, um, but they all do it pretty much the same way, so it works. So um, that's a useful thing. <laughs> So it raises the question, which way is better? Is it better to be individual elements and cloning them? And, and I know I don't need to, to like, or is it clicking to, make a big HTML text to keep attacking. Pass that to like, I don't need to do this. Um, just force of habit. Try to answer that question by, need to stop uh, doing that. Doing just need to let her, let her just swing. Step. You just hold down the mouse button. Build, uh, That's how you're supposed to do it. Manipulate some number of you still need to time it, in obviously. What they were going to do so that they can figure out which is slower. Uh, my recommendation is instead do what makes your code cleaner. That's where I you died can, last you time. Can most likely code I think my guy is over there. What you can most likely maintain correctly. If that turns out to be the wrong choice, you can fix it later. Um, but I think it's a really bad idea to base architectural decisions based on relative performance. Um, it's much heard more something. important to get it right. Um, the next big uh, innovation in the browser was the a zombie event. inside the house. Recall earlier that the, the uh, innovation in Netscape 2 was adding events and scripts. Hmm. So um, the browser has an, an event driven, single threaded programming model. And events are targeted at particular items in, in the DOM. The events cause invocation of event handler functions. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of events. There are the mouse events, um, where the target is the topmost uh, element, which is under the cursor. Uh, it contains uh, click, double click, mouse down, mouse down. So, and there are in 
input events, which generally work on uh, form elements. Okay. Like words, Clicking on the car. Focus, key down, key press, key up, reset. There are three ways of adding event handlers. The classic mode, which Shit. works today still on every browser, is you give them the name of the node. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. Alright, so I don't understand why I can't interact with this car. Again, you concatenate on in front of the type and you also pass it the function And W3C decided that that didn't have enough characters in it, so they came up with another alternative uh, add event listener. Um, understand what that means. It's the same except now we don't have the on. And it also has an extra parameter, which is required. Generally, in JavaScript, you can leave a parameter on. It'll be undefined, and that's also, in this case, you don't get away with the extra parameter. So, which of these? Yes, I can get in. This one works everywhere. This one works only on the IE. This one doesn't work on IE. So, you can either do things twice, or you can use that one, or you can use a top one. I'm in the car. Uh, we're going to get to that. Uh, just remember for now that it's false, and, and it should always be false. What else can I do? So your event handler function. That's the Q button. I don't know what that does. Will be I guess my character value, shouts. And that value will be the event object that will describe what actually happened. Stuff like okay. Uh, it's <laughs> Instead it's because I shout. It's because I shouted. I was so stupid. It's because I did this while I was in the car. that was obviously the wrong way to do it, but that's how they did it. You need to be That's my old character. See, I really am just learning as I go here. I didn't know what the Q button did, and now, now I'm running away from all the zombies. Son of a bitch, they're everywhere. School, uh, which was implemented by Netscape 4, will start at the top of their document group and we look at each uh, generation will be down to so you eventually get to the one and any of the uh, objects on the way down can capture that event and keep it from progressing the rest of the way down. The alternative is the bubble up theory, uh, which uh, is what Where first you visit the, the node that you interact with it and allow it to respond to the event. And then you go to its parent, and its parent, and its parent until you get all the way up to the When W3C looks to solidate those models, one of the questions we asked was, are we going to bubble down or are we going to trickle up? And as so often happens in web standards, they decided, let's do both. Um, so first they do the trickling down and then they do the bubbling up. And, so far. and that extra parameter on the add event listener tells you, or tells it, if you're doing it on the down or on the up. So we want to make it false because we always want to do it on the up. First, because it's a cleaner model. Second, because Microsoft still hasn't implemented it. Um, so you don't want to have an event model which works radically differently from 90% of, of your customers. 
Okay, so we can trickle down or we can bubble up. Why do we even care? I mean, why don't we just send the event to the object that has the event and, and be done with it? It's because uh, the other models allow for God, I thought it was the other window. Laziness. Um, and this turns out to be useful if you oh, have no. a very large set of objects. For example, say you oh, photos so scary. Of, and you want to have 100 draggable images on the screen at once. Um, and they added a set of event handlers to each one, and so every object got click and mouse over and mouse move and mouse up. They pull. Um, full set. If I say they hello to them, they will give me a hug. Um, I'll have to. So I'm about to find set. out if that's true. Set of event handlers and a container for all of those. This was and my what base. Do is look at which of my children is of interest and I'll drag it around. I just broke. So the leveling allows us to uh, take advantage of uh, commonality among different spaces. Um, if we had a different kind of inheritance model in the browser, it wouldn't be necessary. But the browser doesn't have any inheritance models. I think I might have to just go out. Um, now, the leveling doesn't stop once um, an event handler has reacted to something. To explicitly tell the dog the event is handled, don't give it to anybody else. In a sense, don't tell my parents. Just keep it quiet at this point. We're all done. It's finished. Um, there are two ways that you do that. Uh, there's the way you do it on IE, and there's the way you do it everywhere else. Uh, so, which way do you do it? I recommend you do it both ways. It's, it's so lightweight, you know, it's easy to do it both ways. So, on the event option, so it's canceled. Oh, I'm so flat. Run. 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 to go about like mass killing these motherfuckers like there's so many of them and this isn't even like the hardest difficulty this is like baby difficulty and i want to just there's so many of them i can't you know build my little base and get get started attracting all the zombies okay anyway enough whining I still want to do burglars. Okay, so illiterate and high thirst are my two negative traits, which are pretty, you know, I'm assuming, like, you know, with illiterate, you're pretty much shutting off the entire mechanic. So it's like a bit OP, but because it kind of handicaps you in a critical way. Uh, high thirst is really big smart that a lot of people seem to recommend to me. Because it's pretty easy to manage, you know, you can usually find water, at least in the first few days, I guess. Except when there are real errors in the implementation of these things, then you do have to worry about it. This burglar is more rounded out, I would say. So, because of that, you need to explicitly remove all of your event handlers from your nodes before you remove them from the dump. The reason for this is that uh, IE6 uses a Bobby Arnold memory management technique called references. 
Vavi's kind of. Vavi's counting has the advantage that it's very. Vavi's kind of like non-binary. Every time you create a pointer yeah, to an object, you so add let's go. Count by one. We need some envy representation cause a pointer in this cruel, cruel world. Decrement it by one, and when it goes to zero, it's garbage, and you can get rid of it. The problem with that technique is that it doesn't work with the cycles. So if you have two objects that are linked to each other. If nothing else is linked to them, technically they're garbage, but they each have a ref count that's one because they're pointing at each other. Um, so they will never get reclaimed and will always consume memory. And if you get it's funny how you memory, can just fill a wine glass and it's like, yep, now you have a I'm container of water. A but like, because you don't have cycles and we all know you wouldn't be able to walk around just strictly carrying so a wine glass. That makes uh, reference counting safe. The thing that they didn't it's kind of a funny thought. It's kind of a funny thing to imagine to be, to a DOM node, you know, crawling around the bushes going back to JavaScript space. In, the, in your old neighborhood uh, with the, the JavaScript space, you might also have the bodies a, of a variable that's former friends, and lovers, and, likely because you, had to have you know, a DOM element in order extended to family just strewn everywhere. about everywhere, and you're just carrying a little way glass of work. Generally, a glass, a glass of water, but in a wine bottle uh, or wine glass. The programming community you're just, that, you know, it's your fault. That, sipping um, it. You shouldn't be using closure you when you're writing a JavaScript. Look about. It turns out in that language, at all the destruction. Using closure. Anytime you're using a, an inner function, you're using closures. Kind um, of a silly thought. So avoiding closures is not good advice. So what you have to do is okay. fix it anyway. where the problem actually exists, which is on the DOM side. Do that by explicitly is this removing it for Bobby? the rules from the DOM before the DOM rules. <laughs> so you have to break those cycles. Uh, this wasn't an issue for a long time. Jesus. Applications were page oriented. You can show a page and be on the screen for a minute or two and then you go on to another page. And during the time it was on the screen, there wasn't all that much script running. So for it was years and nobody noticed that this bug was going on because of the usage. But now you're doing Ajax applications where that page can be on the screen for hours. And you've got to do Damn it, I hit the wrong thing. It very quickly goes up. This will get fixed with IE7. Okay. Uh, but IE7 is still Need a weapon. On, even though they're going to be pushing it automatically, I expect it's still going to be years before everybody gets it. Yeah. At least before the critical mass approves. So, um, in the meantime, we have to deal with so what we have to do is we do all event handlers and all the This has to be done. This UI is a little frustrating at times. I guess maybe if I just hit E. Also, I don't think that would work anyway. If we do any of these, we'd have to remove the event handlers. Here's a way to do that. Using our Riveting gameplay. Walk the DOM. We pass it this function. And what this function does is look at all of the attributes, and if it finds any that look like functions, null them out. And we call this on an object that we're going to use in this particular case. No, no. Anything you can use YUI, it has a purge element method which we can do this for. The number of uh, features that some people think are not in JavaScript, but are actually not in the specification, are actually the features of the JavaScript. I don't think I equipped them. I recommend that you not use the alert function in the Ajax application. That's because it blocks the browser for it. In Ajax applications, you may have Asynchronous should never use alert. And an alert on the I'm of the opinion, Mr. Sound. Crockford, that there's never a reason to use alert. Be a problem. So I recommend instead you use YUI and put up a nice, uh, nice not, dialogue. And, uh, not one that I'm aware of. It's pretty uh, also available from the browser it's a pretty bad thing to do in any web application is to use alert. Because he's right, it, it blocks the browser thread, it just blocks everything, it just shuts your application down to display an annoying little message. The, the principal meeting point between these two systems. 
Every window frame or iframe has its own unique window object. I sometimes also known as self, and sometimes also known as parent, and also known as top. All of these references usually point uh, to the to the same thing, to the global object. There are a number of of uh, things which are provided to allow for interframe communication. Uh, you've got a, a collection of. Uh, Frames and iframes of, of after this character dies, uh, you've got the name of going your to window take an intermission so that uh, I can make some tea. To and then see if I can do a longer your, stream tonight. Uh, window to get opened or um, just because it's, it's, it's pointer to your I mean, I'm just playing the zomboid. It doesn't take a lot of effort, uh, but uh, like uh, you've got a pointer to yourself. The last two I did was just an hour, and I need to get used to like you know. pointers to yourself that you got them. I would actually really for, like to stream uh, for a, new window, which a long period works, of time. I just uh, but increasingly doesn't. I, I found that my browser had three pop-up blockers on it. They were all active and all uh, blocking pop-ups. I didn't just not really in the right headspace to do it at this point in my life. I think that's but common. eventually, I'd like to get to a place where I can spend about four to five hours on the stream at least every other day. Just because I'm always on the computer anyway. As long as I can figure out something that's uh, frames or windows talking to enriching for everybody else, you know. There are basically two rules. I don't know what I'm talking about. You have you to start start just thinking out loud. Uh, which are, it's not hard to do. You know, the structures I just showed you provide a way of getting references to things. I'm not really doing Another anything is, important. Um, your document dot I don't know why I did that. Exactly the same as their right, turning my brain back on now. This is because of the same origin policy. It's a, um, this isn't really a security issue here. Mostly, it's an annoyance. I need a weapon. Integrity issue. Eat. Um, but it's still something you have to be concerned with. So, if you have a.yahoo.com that wants to talk to a frame that came from b.yahoo.com, their document remains self-natural, so they're not allowed to communicate. But there is a gimmick which allows it to possibly. If they can modify the document domain to something which is a little shorter than what it originally was. So they could both change it to yahoo.com. At that point, they're equal, and then they're allowed to communicate. Oh, hey, Paul. Um, advice. Um, sorry, I need to look at chat more. Advice. Um, there are a number of other things that break in. People have given me a lot of advice, actually. Like, um, I think Krill gave me like a guide. Um, um, this is something which should not be an issue, but in fact is a huge issue. It's just, uh, it's a lot, and I figured I'd enjoy it more just learning through failure. This is made really difficult because like, because of weak standards. The game is surprisingly has a surprising amount of depth to it. Like apparently you can farm. There are three I don't know how, ways but get around this. I have to set up generators and things because the power gets shut off after a few days. So first, uh, browser detection. We determine what kind of browser we're running in. I have to get like. And then we'll execute conditionally based on where we think we are. This prepared is for things like that, but I don't even know what to do. Right. Like right now, I'm just exploring. I wash myself in the outdoor pool. Its navigator user agent identifies itself as Mozilla. That didn't take long. I guessed it was uh, Mozilla. What are we up to now? Seven? Eight? Seven. Uh, no, it identifies itself as Mozilla. I'm, I'm definitely lasting a lot longer yes, than I did before. No, it identifies itself as Mozilla 5. If you guessed so a better five, idea of zero, how to fight the zombies. It identifies itself as Mozilla 5. I definitely still don't know what to do once they are all sort of on to me and they all start chasing me. The only thing I was ever able to successfully do to avoid that before was to outrun them and then hide somewhere, somewhere that you can sleep because they won't lose interest for a very long time. That was the only thing that I could figure to do. them to have to label their flagship product as the product of their most hated competitor had to been a really distasteful thing. So in Internet Explorer 1.5, they started calling it Mozilla, and have ever since. If you guessed Opera 9, 
you're wrong. And it, it identifies itself as off of mine. You have to love those crazy Norwegians. Right now, they are the only browser maker who's telling the truth and identi identifying the browser. I hope this catches on. They, they did it out of desperation. For years, they've been trying to pretend that they were everybody else. I guess they can't do that. that. So they finally decided it's not working. Let's try the truth for a change. Um, I, I hope it does. Anyway, browser detection is not a good idea. Uh, it, it, it's not future facing. Um, it doesn't anticipate what's going to happen next. There are a lot of scripts out there that are looking for Netscape 4 or more, which break badly. <laughs> so it doesn't anticipate what's going to happen. It could be that a different appears, and um, it's compatible enough with these other things that it will work, even though we don't recognize it. Uh, if you want to see the worst possible example of how to do this technique, by the way, you can go to this historical page at Mozilla. It's like 50K of all these different tests of every possible permutation of operating system and browser maker. It's just as wrong-headed as anything you've ever seen. Um, I, I recommend that, but don't use it. Just look at it and laugh. A much better technique is to this takes advantage of the reduction capabilities that we have in JavaScript. And it'll tell us and it will I don't know how to either do that or not. It allows us to execute conditionally based on what's going to happen rather than based on the condition. So, if I wanted to write an add event handler function, one way that I could do that was in is here I ask the node, do you have an add event listener? If yes, okay, we'll do All that. All right, so uh, Bobby's okay, gone. About attach event, you know I'm that. just trying to figure yeah, out where no, that noise okay, is coming you know, from. That, we'll do it the old way. Um, so this is an example of feature detection. Um, we can expect probably all browsers going into the future will know how to do at least one of these. Our program becomes much more resilient now. really bugging me. Uh, because I expect eventually IE will support this one. I don't know when, but you know, they might get around to it soon. Um, now it turns out the way I would actually write this function is this way, because this is always going to work. Um, so why waste your time on the other stuff? Well, ultimately, I think the right way to do it is this way. Where we go to a standard platform utility. Um, because these guys are really, really hard to keep things up to date. Testing all the So they're doing a whole lot of work that you really do. They also provide a lot of Okay, so we learned something there. Uh, uh, so finally, we learned how to take on more than one zombie, to, to which is to have a really heavy weapon, first of all, like this. Now, currently it's estimated there may be 200 Ajax libraries. And to back Ajax. away as you're swinging Every possible kind of configuration so, so that, like, you don't get overwhelmed. Proprietary. Some of them are open. So that some seems to work. Teams. Some of them are big companies, some of them are individuals. I feel like I could have taken some on up to three zombies that way. Some of them are minimal. Some of them are well documented, some of them are not. I should get out of the car, actually. Because my character is about to go into zombie land. I, I think ultimately there are going to be two winners. Um, because while. Okay, well, I wonder how much time I have left. First off, because there's a real need. The APIs provided by the browser are inadequate for doing applications. But JavaScript is such a. I don't want to go inside the house and then become a zombie. So maybe I'll just try and kill a bunch of zombies while I still have time. So that's one reason. The second reason is they're actually kind of fun to make. You know, a lot of people make them just because they are fun. They have communities of interest around their work. Ultimately, though, um, 
software development community is going to say, we can't afford to have 300 different of these sets. I don't want to write one widget that runs on all the browsers. I don't want to have to write 200 widgets that run on top of all the platforms. So the market's going to say, let's consolidate, let's pick one or two, and go with that. Predicting that one of the things that we do is soft apples. They probably have the strongest cool stuff that they website to improve the quality of the standards so that the quality of the implementations get better. Oh yeah, there was a point where Yahoo was like the world's biggest website. Isn't that yeah. funny? They're such a non-player They're like a big nobody. I really like this griggle pan. It's just nice and happy and it just really does a lot of damage. In order to make going back through the photo album faster, uh, they decide to cache a whole lot of state. So they go forward 100 pictures at a time and go back. And each time they went forward, they'd add another 100 pictures to the working set. They're a state. They found that going to the next page would add another half a second. just the JSON data that they're getting back from the server, um, that performance went back up again. So a lot of the things that you might imagine would make applications faster actually make them slower. Unless you, have, you need to be prepared to punch data about what's going wrong and how to manage the, the limited resources that you have. I think one of the things that will help us to do this is getting smarter about the client-server division of labor. Historically, it's been 100% server. And now as we've gotten into Ajax, it's swung way over into the client side. We've got way too much AJAX. going on there. 
need to get better. I think I've used that place Ajax like using the server right, twice ever. Using the browser right and doing the best job possible for the user. Such an outdated lecture. To then you have honest. to watch out for the hole. Um, the hole is the recognition that the browser was not designed to be a general purpose application platform. Um, it's lacking in a bunch of things that we need to have. Some of them are fixed by the uh, Ajax libraries, but some of them are not. Uh, one thing it's lacking is a compositing model. We cannot create new elements out of existing elements. We can bundle them all together, but we don't change what they are, and we can't give them new behaviors. Okay. We can encapsulate a module. I'm going to see. This becomes a particular problem for accessibility. What's up with this character? Sees one of these complicated I thought I got this. It doesn't get the summary of what it's intended to be. It instead gets read all of the individual components of it. And it's Experiencing too much pain to sleep. Bewildering. Uh, the problem is also lacking uh, support for cooperation under mutual suspicion, which is a big problem for doing mashups. Currently, I stay hydrated. Mashup components. There is no way to protect them from each other. It's Any very important. The page has access to everything in the page. Nothing is, is hidden. Um, so mashups work only if all of the information in the mashup is public. If any private information is in there, it is at risk. So with the current state of the art, mashups are not indicated for anything that has any sense of privacy. That's a bad thing. Because of okay, the so like, I'm still so alive. Despite everything. Maybe I didn't get bit. I could have sworn I got bit. Another thing to worry about is that the piece is in The piece that occurred when Microsoft won the war is good. When Microsoft defeated Netscape, Netscape left the field. Microsoft disbanded the IET. Microsoft had appeared for a time to be extremely interested in the browser. They weren't. They were just interested in being this. Once they did, they immediately lost interest in the browser and went on to other things. But they have opened it. Put the team back together and they are being in There are now four major browser makers, not two. Setting the standards of quality because we know historically. I'm so sorry, Bobby. I'm really, I'm really sorry. I knew it. Just getting them out of the way because they're going to get up. Okay, so I'm going to go on intermission and make myself some tea. Um, you're still hanging out. Thank you. Stop really much going on. This is a very, another very chill stream. So, okay. I'll be back.
Hello. One moment. When I found out that Google was doing career certificates and they had one at data. Okay, so tonight, Act 3, uh, Function the Ultimate. We're going to be about talking about functions tonight. Functions are the very best mm. part of JavaScript. Um, it's where okay. most of the power is, it's good. where the beauty is. Um, but like everything else in JavaScript, they're not quite right, but you can work around that, and there's a lot of good stuff here. So tonight, unlike the, the previous two nights, I'm going to be showing you quite a lot of code. Um, because we're talking about functions, you need Okay, so tonight, Act 3, uh, Function the Ultimate. We're going to be about as a name, which can be used uh, to allow. Let's begin. Um, function. Function is the key idea in JavaScript. It's what makes it so good and so powerful. Okay. Um, in other languages, you, you've got lots of things. You've got methods, classes, constructors, modules, Sorry about that. And, and more. In JavaScript, there's just function. And function does all of those things and more. Um, that's not a deficiency, that's actually a wonderful thing, having one thing that can do a lot and do it brilliantly um, um, at scale. Uh, that's what functions do in this language. We're going to use the same build as the last character. Inez Worthington. Okay. Let's go, Inez. Let's do it. I already hear a zombie. This is an instance of a function object. And function objects in this language are first class, which means that they can be passed as an argument to another function. They can be returned as a return value from a function. They can be assigned to a variable and stored in the object. So anything you can do with any other kind of value is going to be a Bobby, no. Bobby, come on. Okay, so if you're standing on top of a zombie, I think they can't get I think maybe that's what it was just. Okay, so we did pretty good for no weapons. 
That was pretty decent, no weapons. Let's not get greedy though. Look at all the zombies I have to kill just to like, you know, make, make the neighborhood safe. Okay. Like, I feel like I can't get anything done this game until I have to stop worrying. Until I can stop worrying about the constant zombies. Controller takes some getting used to. Like, if I turn around, it's still they still have to rotate. And because I didn't, I got bit because of the facing the wrong way. God damn it! So it's confusing having both function expressions and function. Okay. Kill I killed four zombies. Pull, oh, you're right. Uh, the pushing and hitting thing is um, not only does it work better, I'm pretty sure that's how I should be doing it anyway. Because if you just stand still, you just overwhelm you. I'm you know, being a big baby about it, and I should just assert myself more. Uh, okay. The build system is very robust. It's simple but robust. selecting my burglar builds because I want to break into that car and I don't know where to find the keys. Shelly Lechance. Shelly Lechance. Lechance. Let's go Shelly. Shelly's hair is cool. The only weakness to the strategy with walking like this and pushing is you can't see what's behind you. Yeah. <laughs> 
official Hold on a second, and, chat. Uh, turn it into a statement that returns undefined, which is tragically awful. Um, there are two pseudo parameters that every function can receive. Uh, one is called arguments, and the other has the unfortunate name of this. Um, so let's look at arguments first. When a function is invoked, in addition to the parameters that it declares, it also gets a special parameter called argument. And it contains all of the arguments that were actually specified in the invocation. Um, it's an array-like object, but it is not an array, um, which is unfortunate. And I'll show you some examples of why that's unfortunate. Um, it's array-like in that it has a length property. So you can ask uh, arguments how many parameters were actually, or how many arguments were actually passed to this function, uh, which might be different than the number of parameters that you specified. Um, it also has very weird interaction with parameters. Um, if you change um, one of the elements of the arguments array, you may change. Sorry about that. I had, to, I had to blow my nose. Um, and if you do something really scary, to be, like, to be very honest, do splicing on the I suddenly array, really needed to blow my nose. And all of your so. Um, so generally, you don't want to mess with the arguments array. You <laughs> I got bit. I got greedy there. I thought I could take him both on. Find my old character. suffix operator, which um, is used for invoking or calling or executing a function. Um, it surrounds zero or more comma-separated uh, expressions, which would become the arguments of, uh, of the function. And those arguments will be bound to the parameters of the function. Um, if a function is called with too many arguments, the extra arguments are ignored. You don't get an error for that. Um, it's just ignored. But they'll still go into the arguments array. Um, so if you want to find out about them, they're still accessible to you. If a function is called with too few arguments, that's not an error either. Um, it will fill in undefined for any things that you did not include. And there's no implicit type checking at all. Um, 
So if the types of the parameter is important to you, you need to check them yourself to form a function. And there are four ways to call a function. There's the function form, the method form, the constructor form, and the body form. Um, and they differ in what they do to the bit. So in the method form, we have an object. And we say dot. This is the most. This, T H I S, in any language where there's a this or a self, it is often one of the most dangerous things to just use willy nilly without a good understanding of what it refers to and how the language implements the idea. is about to kick. I've done that. It's annoying. It's annoying to have to do that. Somebody's not mentioning. It's very awkward. It is genuinely the only way to handle that situation, obviously, but... I don't understand how to use these yet. I don't understand what that refers to. Belts. The game has a pause button. Wow. Makes sense. That is the conceit of functional programming. 
that it seems to be under the impression that the world doesn't mutate. Well, it's not under the impression of that, it's just like it wants the language to behave as if the world doesn't mutate. And so, like Crockford said, you eventually um, start limiting your ability to do interesting things with a functional programming language because your language can't handle the concept of mutation or change. Great. Now, I didn't even realize that could happen. stand much of a chance. You know. Stearns. Valeria. Valeria Stearns. Where did I die? Oh, shit. Oh, my God. I love the dive they do. They turn into like a wet noodle. Last hour. I'm just getting bit. I just wanted to get the griddle pan. There's still people in here. Well, now I'm in there. So. I want to fix 
something. Hold on. Okay. Sorry, now you can see the full video. There's really not a lot of reason for me to experiment with different builds yet, because I still obviously don't really understand what I should be doing with my time. I'm really just annoyed I haven't gotten into that. I can't end the stream until I get to that car, because I want to see what happens. Got a frying pan. Yeah. This incrementers, um, they make me think too much about something that should be really simple. I always just do plus equals. more explicit. Let's have That's what I'm talking about. Let's do that. Let's do more of that.
case it's a fairly trivial thing. Closure provides a really nice way to do that. So now I have a function and it has a private name variable and it returns a function. And that the function it returns is assigned to digit name. Um, so the important thing is notice at the bottom we're invoking the function now. We're invoking the function we need it. So what I'm storing in digit name is not the whole function, it is the function that it returns. Okay, this is really important. Um, and in order to give the reader a clue that there's something interesting going on here, uh, because um, assigning a function looks almost the same as assigning a function that's immediately invoked, I wrapped it in parent. So the whole thing is wrapped in the golden parent. And that's a clue to the reader. It's not required by the language, but I think it is required by human. Um, gives us a clue that there's something really interesting going on here. Um, so, um, so we uh, assign the return value of the outer function to digit name. The outer function has now returned. Digit name now contains a function, which is the green Right function. now I'm seeing if I can the find those car keys. Access to names, even though names is a private variable of a function that's already returned. That's, that's closure. This turns out to be one of the most important features of JavaScript. This is the thing that it got amazingly right. And this is the thing that makes JavaScript one of the world's brilliant programming languages. Um, there's a, a, another pattern going around uh, called uh, lazy function definitions. Um, I show you this as a warning. Don't do this. Um, the, the idea here is that um, in, in this form, uh, I, I unconditionally initialize the, uh, the function before uh, we're going to start calling it. But what if the initialization is really expensive, so we don't want to do it um, unless we know the function is going to end up getting called at least once. So this lazy pattern attempts to do that. So what it does is it assigns to digit name a function. Sorry, I'm the first paying attention to this part called, of the lecture. Um, it will then um, store another function into the same variable. So it'll replace itself, it'll modify itself. Um, and the idea here is that uh, that allows us to avoid having to initialize the thing if we don't need to do it. But there's a, a it comes at a cost. Um, and the cost is uh, confusion. That um, uh, digit name is no longer first class. And that if I were to pass it to a function, let that function call it, or if I were to uh, assign it to an object and let someone call it as a method. Um, it, the, the, um, every time it gets called from that point on, it will do the initialization and stuff a new function into digit name. So instead of making it faster, we've actually made it slower. It's slower than the slow case that we started off with. Now, you, mm. um, the okay, counter whatever. argument is, okay, well, you've got to be really careful to, do it, to not do that. So, it's a really shitty thing to do anyway. I don't know why anybody would want to do that. Only be called from the global variable. You can't use the function value as a function value. Oh, here we are. Dead rat. Let's put that in the fridge. And that it's worth it because we're saving the initialization. Uh, it turns out that the analysis is wrong. All we're saving is the cost of the if So here we're going back to the closure form. Except I put an if statement in it so that um, it, uh, it will initialize, it initialize it now. So, it do it all. so the cost of this compared to the previous one was one if statement per invocation, which is an So the optimization that we were hoping to get was way before. Watch the flag, man. Why would I need to watch the flag? It's kind of weird.
I can't find the keys. Would it be hidden in something? Are they even guaranteed to exist? It's kind of a bummer. I want to use the car. I'm trying to figure out how I brought up that one menu from before. Q will just call the zombies. And what was that? Z. The Z button. Intuitive. That's what I would have thought it would be. That's what I thought it would be. And now, now I'm in the back of the car. Now, now I'm in the back to the left. Now I'm in the driver's seat. No gas and no keys. If I leave, if I leave the lights on, the battery will die too. This thing is useless to me. It has no gas, no key. That was such bullshit. 
Okay, we, we got through that. We got through that one. So, okay. I need a new weapon. Son of a bitch. A zombie. I don't think either of those things are weapons. Thank you. 
So I have no weapons. So, that car is useless, so I think the burglar build is now a useless to me. Yeah, trick out of the toilet. Let's go. Let's go.
This was the inheritance thing that was designed for the Bleeding. <laughs> Bleeding really bad. Minor. It's just minor bleeding, why? I see. Look. Here I walk, there's blood. It's not minor bleeding, that's like take me to a hospital right now, kinda of bleeding. Just lost, like you know, kind of blood. No big deal. Two, three, maybe four. I genuinely feel, at least at this point, in learning about this game, that it should not be so difficult to find a blunt weapon. An apocalypse type thump. There should be blunt tools everywhere. I'm sorry, it's just unrealistic that I have to. I have to look at so many houses just to find one stupid item I can use as a weapon. It's frustrating. And it doesn't make sense. Like, there's so many things that you'd be able to use. I could just. Almost anything heavy. This is a bad situation. There's four of them. Five of them now. Thing we can do with, with is create um, 
like to be able to um, avoid creating global variables, to minimize use of global variables because of the conflicts that they can create. And functions provide a very nice way of doing it. Here I want to create a singleton object, so I'll create one instance of it. Because you don't want to have to create a class to define something that's just going to be one instance of it. That's a mistake. Um, so I'm going to assign to singleton not to that function, but the consequence of calling that function. Again, I'm wrapping the whole function and the invocation in pairings as a sign to the reader that there's something bigger going on, the assignment of a function. For some people who took the, um, the golden um, parent around the function, not around the whole invocation, that doesn't make sense to me. What we're trying to tell the user is look at the whole thing. And putting parentheses around the whole part of it, I think, is counterproductive. never anything in these these fucking dressers never it's always just book like, i don't understand if it's like the game mode of it or if this is just a level of scarcity that the game likes to have but it's just like oh every house is just house with book in it house with book in spaghettis and pears and apples and Maybe if you're lucky, maybe if you're lucky, in the entire house there will be one object that is sufficient to be used as a blunt weapon against zombies, if you're lucky. It's just, you should be able to find something a little easier, like a fork or a knife or something. Un not unreasonable for a house to have lots of those, even in a zombie. Apocalypse. Nobody's grabbing all their knives up as they run out the door. So, This is a part of the game where I just run. This is a really useful pattern, the one that he just described. Closure is really, genuinely a really powerful construct in a language like JavaScript. 
I, I like thinking about applications more that way than a series of class files and a main scope. You know. I don't really understand much about the environment that JavaScript creates for itself because it's like a mix of the browser and, you know, I guess in Chrome, V8, I really don't understand the environment, I only really understand the um, higher level application level. So I'm just back at these houses. I just did a circle. I've been running around forever. I should drink some water. I've been running around forever just being like, is there anything? Is there anything I can use as a weapon? Is there anything useful that I can do? I saw there were a few cars. Like the base idea for this game of just staying alive, you know, I understand I'm trying to do that, I'm trying to stay alive as long as possible, but what is the next step in terms of ensuring that? Because as of now, as of now, nothing's going to happen to my character other than just die in a day or two, because... I thought I drank water. I'm never able to sleep because I'm always I'm always in pain. I'm unpleasantly hot. Been there. Oh shit. I'm just eating raw coffee grounds.
happening because of closure. Because uh, the church has been closing over the memory of the it's a part of, this is a part of the lecture I haven't paid a lot of attention to. And that's pretty interesting. How does it go from... How does it reduce the number of iterations Fibonacci takes? I, did, I wasn't paying attention so I don't understand how. I'm more really mumbling too much. Can you even hear what I'm saying? Or am I just mumbling a lot? Sorry. I don't want to wake anybody in my house. Uh, I'm about to call it because. Maybe as I'm going to bed tonight, I'll watch some videos about like things that you can do besides just run around, kill zombies, and loot houses. I mean, that stuff's fun, but like there needs to be a larger goal at play, obviously, or else it just gets really boring. Like, oh, this time I've gotten much better at killing the zombies. Was a gunshot. Why was there a gunshot? Is there somebody else out here? I think it. I think it's up here. Will other people shoot me? Nervous wreck. I feel bad. I feel really bad. Don't be nervous. What's the worst that can happen? No door. Search mode. One of them uses a variable, the other uses a parameter. Uh, which was its correspondence between the variables and the parameters. And JavaScript demonstrates it really well. So um, this shows that uh, you could uh, imagine a a subset of JavaScript which didn't have variables, would that still be a useful language? It turns out, yes, and this is the proof that um, anything you can write with variables, you can write without variables. Um, you can use a function closure. Uh, all functions, all closures, no variables, no more variables. Variables, they're, you know, so not in right now. it returns is the recursive factorial function. This is really wild stuff. Um, and if you can figure this out, you can call yourself a, a computer scientist. Because th this is this is the really good stuff. And you can express this stuff in JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript is right up there with Lisp and Scheme. It is a functional language. You can do this stuff. And while uh, this may have a little practical value, Preach. Um, Preach, Mr. Crockford. Preach. your powers as a programmer. This is the stuff to be playing with. You can get really, really deep. I see a lot of people playing with their Ajax stuff and wanting to show off, look at all the stuff I can do, and 
sometimes doing things which uh, are probably reckless and, and ultimately not very smart. But if you want to show that you're really smart, you ought to be doing this stuff. Um, off, you know, to the side where you're not going to hurt anybody. Um, so I mean, life combinator is cool and everything, but like, really good part. Uh, and, and these, I think, I, unless they just meant like, again, this comes you should be doing more functional programming in, in JavaScript, but there's not really anything that I want to do with the Y Combinator itself. It's just, it's more or less just a proof of what it can do, what the language is capable of expressing. The reason I was able to discover that JavaScript had good parts. I guess he just I means you should be, you should stop I trying to treat JavaScript in a little book like a class-based C-like language because it's not. Um, it, the current edition of it is called the Little Schemer. It was updated um, to be about schemes. I think we're going to call it here. Scheme. There isn't very much scheme um, in the book. Um, thanks for tuning in. About functions, and it's, it's really this lecture great. with. Crockford is pretty much over can be written in JavaScript. anyway. So, JavaScript couldn't be more different syntactically. At the root, who is similar. And so there's a simple uh, transformation from one language. I'm going to try reading. Uh, if you go to this web page, it'll show you exactly just to see what it's like. That'll so, be enough to be able to read and write examples in the book. Highly, highly recommend. So you go out See you later, school. chat. Be nice to Amy. She's really cool. Change the way you think. Um, and there are very few books that do that. This is one of those. Oh, books. again. So I can't do that. Next time we meet, uh, the metamorphosis of Ajax. I'm just um, too new. It'll be awful. So. Or something. I don't know. I have, I really have to figure it out because I want to be able to rate people, even if it's just like one other person. It's just like, it's like a nice gesture. Um, all right. Good night, chat. Thanks for tuning in. When you get your next big idea, Grammarly's Total Suggestions can help pitch it.